It is literally a fantasy burn against Michael Moore <laughs> that is not based on truth. No. Right? They might as well be like, I know how it started. I bet you got a big wedgie. And one time, one time after that party where all the lights went out, I met you in the parking lot and I was like, don't make me use my super risk control karate on you. And you were like, you won't. And then I did. And I was so, I was so good. And I did control your wrist so hard. <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because atheists don't get absolution. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting <laughs> 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Woof. Pass. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> oh, we should just play the credits music now, right? Unsubscribe. <laughs> uh, and sitting 900 Please miles Please don't unsubscribe. My- Please don't unsubscribe. <laughs> Oh, not after this. No, you absolutely cannot. By just out of respect for what we've been through, you have to give it listen, at least three weeks. You have to go to Target and tackle people <laughs> and subscribe <laughs> them to our show after this week. <laughs> and sitting 900 miles to my northeast, that voice you just heard was my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Woof. Ibit. Ibit. Woof. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched a hate crime, yep. a literal hate crime. Sure did. What's the title again? American Carol? An American Carol. We watched yes. an American Carol. It's the story of a Republican comedian's first open mic, and they did their tight five about Islam from 2008. But it's way longer than five yeah, minutes. Yeah, yes. It's so yeah. long. They're tight 89 or whatever. Yeah. And Eli... How bad was this movie? Well, if you've been laboring under the delusion that Trumpism was a new low (laughs) and you needed a 13 year old reminder that this has always been their game plan and platform, you will get super depressed while watching this movie. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, like this movie, like might take the crown for the, oh, not hims. Right. <laughs> Start, starting with his director, David Zucker of Abram Zucker and Zucker fame. I love the airplane. I love police squad. I dutifully ignored top secret guys. <laughs> no, but look, one of these people went on to direct ghost. One went on to direct hot shots and hot shots part. Two, and the other went on to direct this. I wonder where the talent was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best and being the worst at? Yeah, I'm going to go with best, worst, bad prophecy not working out for them. The movie so many times says something is definitely like this crazy. (laughs) This is not going to happen. The Republican Party won't be this ever. And then all of them happen. Yeah, all of them right away happen. And and the other way, too, is like, oh, you know, it's only a matter of years before this happens. And of course, nothing like that ever happened. Yeah, Mm -hmm. not once over and over again. Just the future just punching the movie in the dick every time. Yeah. Yeah, right. So I was going to go with best worst shitting on your own joke. So the thing about this movie is its political message is so overt and so offensive and so stupid that it's easy to lose track of just how criminally unfunny it is, right? Like on the rare occasion that this movie happens upon a funny setup, which it does a couple of times, it will immediately shit all over it or else have no idea what to do and then panic cut before it gets to a punchline. It's like... Do you know that scene in like a scary show or like a primetime drama where the racist makes a racist joke to someone to indicate that they're going to hurt them? And you're like, oh, no, I don't want to watch this movie. It That's like the, that joke, the movie. That's what this movie, this movie is just like yeah. guys backing someone into a corner of an alley on HBO. <laughs> the movie. <laughs> Yeah, except you're the victim. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, except it's me. Right, it's, it's me and my eyeballs. And I'm gonna go for it here, gentlemen. Correct me if I'm wrong. I am gonna go for worst, worst movie. This is the least enjoyable thing we have ever watched. 
I, you know, it's, I don't know if I'm going to go that far with it, but it's definitely on the list, right? If we're listing the worst ones, if we're doing, given our top 10 or whatever, this definitely makes the list. This was downright unpleasant from start to finish. Right. Cause some of the bad stuff we watch, at least it's bad good. Yeah. This is bad, bad. Every conceivable second of it. Right. Is bad, bad. Right. Well, and, and, but also it's like, it's not bad enough to have, you know, silly, funny lighting and everything, or like not knowing where to put the camera shit like we so often encounter, right? These are actual filmmakers who know how to make a film, but made this instead. Jesus. So bizarre. All right. Well, we've got to make funny out of ingredients that are pretty much antithetical to that. So we're going to pause to think this over, but we'll be back in a flash with all the under the breath racist grumblings that are an American Carol. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, podcast listener. You know, here on God Awful Movies, we like to make our ads fun little skits, songs, or wacky shenanigans, because let's face it, podcast ads can be boring. But once in a while, we have a sponsor who we like to just look you straight in the eye. Well, the, the ear. We, we talk you straight in the ear and recommend our sponsor. And this week, that's better help. Look, the holidays can be really, really stressful. There can be fighting, drama, and especially this year, grief all mixed up in that basket. And having a licensed professional therapist to talk to can really help. And it's important to understand that you don't need a diagnosed mental illness to benefit from therapy. You don't need to be at the edge of your rope. Sometimes you just need someone to talk to. And BetterHelp can match you with a licensed professional therapist in under 48 hours. There's a broad range of expertise available. So if you need a therapist who's secular, queer affirming, or hey, even ASD trained, they can help you with that. And look, I also know how expensive this time of year can be, but BetterHelp is cheaper than traditional offline therapy. Financial aid is available and GAM listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. Visit BetterHelp.com slash awful. That's better H-E-L-P and join the over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And hey, even if you don't use BetterHelp, be good to yourself, okay? I'm glad you're here. All right, everyone, I don't mind saying it, but I think we've put together the best ding-dang writing team you could ask for to show old Michael Moron a thing or two. <laughs> Moron. That's not his name. Got him. I sure did. His name's different than that. All right, so introductions. Uh, this is Adolf Hitler. Uh, hi, me, everyone. Hi. Of course. This is Satan, Prince of Darkness. What up? People who read and answer text while you're talking to them, I'm very glad you could make it. Yeah, one second. Just L-O-L, you bitch. What? What did you say? And, of course, the very concept of losing a child. This dude flew in to be here, so I'm very grateful for you. Hey, everybody. Yeah, glad to be here. All right. So uh, why don't we just yell all our gripes about modernity into this jar, put a couple of drops of orphan blood in there, and come back tomorrow morning and see what kind of movie we made. Sounds good. Totes, 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 totes. Octoroons. You, you have to wait for me to say go. Oh, sorry. Octoroons. Oh. <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to start off with me getting mad at a logo for having the Brooklyn Bridge in it. You guys don't get <laughs> New York shit. Yeah, this is like the fact that all the Fox News anchors live on Central Park West. Like, they need, no, this is not for you. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Do they? Yeah, yeah. all of them. Oh. <laughs> And they, they constantly talk about how they're neighbors on air. And you're like, get the fuck out of my city. God. Go live in the real America, you garbage. Yeah, right. We, I mean, so, some some good stuff happened on Central Park West that could work out with the Fox. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Moving on. I was reading Catcher in the Rye the other so day. The, <laughs> <laughs> so the movie opens with a little Leonard Skinner, the band so rednecky it's spelled with a twang. Ugh. And also... Yeah, this is Sweet Home Alabama, and I wrote in my notes, ah, yes, the real America with not a person of color in sight. And then the moment I wrote that, the one person of color in this picnic scene gets hit in the face with a Frisbee. Yeah. yeah. And it, it okay, so normally somebody gets hit in the face with a Frisbee. That's just objectively funny. That's a funny thing to happen in real reality. Just it's a physically funny thing. Oh, yeah. This happens not funnily. They don't they, they fuck up a naturally funny thing somehow. Well, and we should point out the movie is filled with not funny slapstick, right? Yep. What's really interesting is when you realize that this is the Zucker, right? This is one of the guys who made Airplane. It's like 
they used the same spices as airplane, but they did lines of them instead of putting them <laughs> in the food. Yep. If you told me, like, we made an AI watch all the airplane movies <laughs> and also one Hitler speech that was on the end of the VHS by accident, this would be the result. Yeah, so we're at a we're at a big Fourth of July cookout, and and Leslie Nielsen is the grandpa. That's sad. God. And so he goes over to the table where all the kids are. He brings them burgers. The burgers aren't very tasty. Humor, humor. We'll we'll just insert the tag humor to make it clear. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the movie should have given us a little hint. I was gonna say I wish the movie had done that. <laughs> just like had someone in the corner holding up just an hold applause up a sign. sign. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, if if ever a fucking cinematic feature could have benefited from a laugh track, this is the one. But the kids don't like his burgers, but they love his story. So they want him to tell them a story. So he decides to tell them a story about the Scrooge of the 4th of July, which is such a crazy conceit for a movie, right? Like if you want to do a Scrooge story, set it at Christmas. Yeah, no, that would have been helpful. This movie's visionary. They throw they throw that whole concept on its ear <laughs> and they twist it up. Opposite end of the year and everything genius take on dickens See, if, if we needed a july 4th tacular movie this would have been the film but you know we, we decided to put it here instead so yeah and also small thing but this movie has the worst audio editing that i've ever encountered in a movie that had real <laughs> actors in it okay, yes that's not a small thing what happens here <laughs> what happens here is terrifying i was scared <laughs> i'm watching a movie what leslie nielsen says well, uh, to begin his story. And then a second later, they, they do ADR and he's like, it's like, well, uh, uh, the story begins on a mountaintop. <laughs> what did he get wrong on a? Uh? He did a uh, wrong? It's, it's like he just yelled a bunch of racial slurs or something in this and that they had to pull. I, I, I don't know. It's like, I've never heard something this bad in podcasting. Yeah. Yeah, if I died midway through this record and Noah and Heath needed to finish the episode <laughs> by doing like a weird anti-Semitic impersonation of me for the remaining 26 uh, minutes. I'm Eli. I Oz. The Jewish is me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So bad. Yeah, but but Grandpa's story is going to be the movie, right? So and and I think the plot is that Grandpa has early onset dementia, but we'll get to that. Yep. The story begins with some terrorists in Afghanistan, and it's just going to get more racist from there, guys. Just strap in. Oh, you know, we know we're uh, going to Afghanistan because there's a gong here. Yep. <laughs> gong right. culturally it's it's in Asian. the music of Af Afghanistan. I <laughs> those, those are corresponding. It's like someone made a comedy movie out of what your Uncle Frank mumbles under his breath at the Thanksgiving kids table he's been banished to. Ah, that that's it. That's what it was. It's not. It's not the comedian. It's it's Uncle Frank at Thanksgiving. It's mumbling. Yeah. Maybe he did a. Maybe he did a, an open mic. But it's that. Yes. <laughs> it's him getting ready for the open mic. He'll never have the courage to do. I would pay to go to Uncle Frank's open mic and just be like, boo, <laughs> boo. So and of course, just to give you an idea how racist this movie is going to be in its jokes. The first bit that it does is that all the terrorists are named Muhammad because you know how those people are all named Muhammad, right? And their last names are all Hussein. That's the level of humor that we're opening the movie with, really. And it's a seven minute long joke, too. Yeah. yeah. And then like seven minutes after this movie, Barack Hussein Obama got elected president and they were yes. so mad. Yeah. They were so mad. Everybody who had made this if there's a saving grace to this film it's how sad everyone was in november of that year yeah. <laughs> right yeah. yeah moments later yeah so but they've got this they, they're gonna do a a little shtick about suicide bombing now nope. I, i'm not i'm not even gonna say that you can't make suicide bombing funny i'm but i'm gonna say that they can't <laughs> yeah right <laughs> they are going for rubber chicken-esque humor about yes. suicide bombing. Okay, if there was a rubber chicken, this would have been way funnier. I was <laughs> yeah. That's a weird way to describe it. Yes, I, I would say suicide bombing is object. It's like a Frisbee thing. They fuck up another Frisbee thing here. That's just great material <laughs> yep. potential. Get a rubber chicken, man. <laughs> but now we should point out that like the conceit of this joke and indeed this entire movie 
is that what the U.S. is doing in Afghanistan sure will be good ultimately for the Af- the people of Afghanistan. The common people, sure, their lives sure will be improved because of the U.S. occupation. American policy with regard to Afghanistan will never be problematic. That's yep. right. This is the first of many. There will not be a single proven bad idea that this movie doesn't defend. I mean, <laughs> stop and frisk, racial profiling, homophobia. Like they, they, At a certain point, they might as well be like a pro-alchemy skit in the middle of this game. What do you guys think about Euclidean geometry? Are we serious about that? Are we doing, <laughs> are we all really on board with that? Well, and, and just in case the audience was going, oh man, are Middle Eastern people the only ones we're going to be racist against? We have the uh, caricature of Mexican immigrants drive by. Yeah, accompanied by the like mariachi band sound effect. Yep. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't have a gong for that too somehow. <laughs> it's foreign. <laughs> it keeps, it's different. It's gong means not America. We all know gong is not American. It's not Leonard Skinner. I hit the dong. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they they also do gay marriage here for a second yeah. but mm-hmm. they don't do anything with it when i say do that's real that that's a bad using a verb doesn't make sense <laughs> they just said they're like gay marriage is nailed it voting uh mexican immigrants are <laughs> they drive by gross, and trucks done done with it's just republicans listing setups but they yep. never do a joke right they just say a, t- yep, a topic they panic cut away yeah and then they panic cut away exactly <laughs> i hesitate to use the word interesting about this movie but one of the <laughs> things that is interesting about this movie is to see the political topics that they're brave enough to make jokes about and the political topics that they just mumble under their breath so mm-hmm. that you know what they right so they're not like gay marriage is bad they're just like gay marriage and so that your uncle at home could be like hey, hey gays i don't like them yep yes exactly but so we cut to them like the main terrorist and his two lackeys are at a restaurant talking about how you know their job as terrorists has gotten so hard because the people of Afghanistan have welcomed the Americans with open arms so much and love yeah. our presence there. Oh, no, it's too great for us here in Afghanistan. What will we terrorists do? Yeah. But they realized that the key to their problems is that they need a new terrorist training video. Mm-hmm. And then we, we cut to the old video, right? That's the next bit. They have like this goofus and gallant terrorism thing where we learn that they think that the rule of threes is just to tell us the joke three times in case we didn't get it the first two mm-hmm. yeah it's not the rule of thrice guys that's just the same. It's, you've done the same thing now thrice that's fine also it's okay this feels weird but they show us this video and yeah it's the the goofus and gallant thing and they show us two different types of guy one one guy is like the bad suicide bomber who's does things not organized. And then the other one is the good one. And then they show him in three different scenarios. How is the same guy can't be in multiple suicide bombings. It would, I, again, I feel weird. It's like a weird note to give, you know, the continuity editing of a <laughs> the training video for suicide bombing in this horrible fucking movie. But it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. The plot makes no sense here. Well, but this is a great example of my best worst, right? Because the first time you see it, it's actually kind of funny, right? They're like, you know, so and so the good terrorist uh, shows up on time for his suicide bombing and it shows him go inside a building and it blows up. And he's like, uh, but the bad terrorist doesn't show, you know, doesn't check his clock. And they show him like walking up to the place and he goes, ah, oh, shit and explodes. That actually kind of works, you know, in the stupid yeah. universe of who they're trying to make a movie for. But then they do the exact same fucking joke two more times. They have to shit all over it. Yep. It's like it's the rule. It's like the kid who fell in the pool and everyone laughed at him throwing himself into the pool for the rest of the party in the hopes he's going to get laughs again. Okay, I'd laugh at that kid eventually, though. They don't get me to laugh. Eventually. Yeah, that's right. Right. It's, yeah. it's like a they do that worse badly version of that and a racist version as well. They do that, but they don't fully commit to it and racist. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All of my metaphors are going to fail us. For this. Yeah. <laughs> There's, it's a, this is not metaphorical. Yep, this movie is like this movie. <laughs> All right. 
So now we're going to we're going to meet our main character here. This is their Michael Moore look like I just they have he's Michael Malone in the movie. I just wrote him in as Michael Moore in my notes throughout. Yeah, I don't know why they bother changing. God, him. this is Chris Farley's brother. Yeah, it's yeah. Kevin Farley. It's so fucking sad. Hey, let's have a little positivity, huh? A little positivity. Brighten up this review. Thank God Chris died and glad couldn't Chris died. do this fucking movie. Literally wrote, glad Chris died. Let's take a moment <laughs> to appreciate heroin and cocaine mixed together. <laughs> that were, that, that the worst of his legacy is Beverly Hills Ninja. Yeah. <laughs> there's, the, there's the other side of that speedball coin is this. Yep. All right. So he's in the... um. The Michael Moore character, though, his, he's in Cuba. They're, they're doing a send up of the scene from Sicko where he takes the Americans to Cuba to get medical care because they can't afford it in the U.S. And the joke here is that, you know, Cuba isn't awesome because our decades long humanityless blockade turned it into a hellhole for generations of innocent people. <laughs> right. Get it? Nailed it. Also, bad breath. That's funny. Yeah. I think we can all agree that Michael Moore crossed a pretty serious line when he suggested that sick people should be taken care of, right? Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. Let's, let's dedicate a full 90 minutes to bashing someone who wants sick people to be well. <laughs> For yeah. that his audacity. And yes. The point they're making here is that, like, okay, well, Cuba's got, you know, universal health care, but... Look at this line of 10 people you would need to wait in to get yes! yep. free medicine. That that sucks. In their exaggerated airplane comedy hellscape, they have not come up with something worse than the actual system we have. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, no kidding. Well, and then they try to like, so like the Michael Moore character goes to leave and then everybody tries to get on the boat with him because they all want to go to America. And the joke here is supposed to be, oh, if Cuba is so good, why would they all want to go to America? And it's like they they would rather live in the oppressor nation than the oppressed one is enough. Pretty simple. Right. <laughs> also, if we're talking about medicine, people literally drove to Canada to get medicine and then bring it back to the U.S. What the fuck are you talking about? That's right. what actually happened now. I I actually had to price going down to Mexico to have my fucking dental work done. Jesus. Would have been about the same price to go down and have it done and come back as it was to just have it done here. If the empire is so bad, where did they get all those stormtroopers? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Perhaps we didn't hear both sides of the story. Oh, and this is also, they. I love this little bit because it's a recurring thing throughout the movie. The Grandpa Vio cuts in at this point and introduces it for the first time, but they keep pointing out that nobody really likes Michael Moore's movies. They just pretend to, or whatever they're trying to say. I just, I want to point out Fahrenheit 9-11 is the top grossing documentary of all time by more than 50% over the next highest one. Yep. So just every time they make a joke about how nobody likes his movies, just keep that one in mind. And I will point out that if this movie has a through line, it is more and more pathetic actors shitting on documentaries. Yep. Right. By the end of it, it might as well be a crying me outside my failed Book of Mormon audition, like wiping the tears and snot from my face to say, well, at least I'm not a documentarian. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I I am not the peak of that joke. The peak of that joke is Kevin Sorbo. That's that's yeah, not actually, me. yeah, right, yeah. right. I have a podcast. Fuck you. <laughs> I have a podcast so much better than this movie. And there's also there's also this thing, and it originates in this scene where they have a child call him fat. Oh yeah, and they'll just have random characters call him fat. And if if I can peel back the curtain ever so slightly. My fourth least favorite kind of audience feedback we get is because of a, a charity fundraiser. And you, some of you will know about it that we do called Vulgarity for Charity, where we do roast jokes about people that they send in. And so my fourth least favorite kind of audience feedback is sometimes people will tweet or Facebook message or even email me a roast back mm -hmm. because we were having a conversation and I have to usually nicely write them back and explain that even though I was in their ears, I am doing jokes on a comedy show. They just wrote insults to a stranger. <laughs> right. If yeah. Everyone who had ever made that mistake and sent me a personalized roast email got together. They would write the insults for Michael Moore in this film. So, like 90% of the time in the writer's room 
of this movie was spent saying, and then he could get kicked in the nuts and somebody could call him fat again. Yeah. He's fat. And then 19 minutes of high fives. Right. Yes. And cocaine. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Most of the time was high fives following those suggestions. If you told me that this movie was just Tucker Carlson's shower fights transcribed, <laughs> it makes a lot more sense. Right. So we cut to the opening night of his Cuba movie and everybody's really excited, but they hate it. There's this weird dichotomy of everybody going to his movies, but nobody watching them or something that they're trying to do here, I guess. Everybody slept through his movie, you see. not It didn't really keep your attention like this masterpiece that we're watching. But this is also where we learn that Michael Moore wants to abolish the 4th of July. But that's, it's, they, they think stupid liberals want to abolish a day. Right. We're just going to skip straight from the 3rd to the 5th. <laughs> I want to do that now for spite. Honestly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Two votes. I actually do. So, yeah, withdrawn. I would like to do that. Let's abolish the fucking 4th of July. I'm actually behind that now. You know but what? Yeah, Fuck let's you. Let's give that date of February. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. If it would upset the people who made this movie, I'm for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we cut over to Michael Moore's Abolish the Fourth of July headquarters. And this is where the movie starts shitting on the concept of peace demonstrations. Yep. Peace demonstrations. They are anti. They, they will spend a significant percentage of this movie being like people who want social change are gay. Yeah. Some of them. So to be clear. The movie has come out now as anti-peace. Yep. Okay. So, and then we have the misgendering joke, because that's super funny. Classic. They have gay soldiers joke. Yep. Yep. And this is where we introduce this... God, Jesus, he's so barely a character, because this movie's so poorly thought out. We introduce Michael Moore's nephew, Josh, who is a a sailor who's shipping out to Afghanistan the next morning. But before he does, he invites him to his barbecue, just like the Charles Dickens story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Josh wants him to come to his July 4th celebration. He's like, but I'm trying to abolish July 4th and make it skip straight to the 5th. And he's like, all right, but for the record, your hero, John F. Kennedy, would be on my side of this argument. Right. Would he? Would he? <laughs> My favorite part of this scene, though, that I have to mention is the Trey Adkins plug. Uh, Trace Adkins, yeah. Uh -huh. Trace Adkins, right. So he's like, yeah, there's going to be a big Trace Adkins concert. And miraculously, this movie will actually settle on, yeah, Trace Adkins fucking sucks and so does country music. But this is where they have that, like, Psh, maybe you haven't heard of Trace Adkins, the very good musician who lots of people <laughs> like. <Okay. laughs> Seriously? I wrote my notes like, Okay, but am I supposed to know who Trace Atkins is? <laughs> is he famous? Is that is he actually a famous? Uh, yeah, if, he's, if 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 you're a country music fan, you know who Trace Atkins is. Yeah. If you're a shitty country music fan, you're not you're well, not no, like yeah, listening. Not, yeah, not like the country music like that Anna listens to that's actually good. No, no. If you're if you're a fan of pop country, you've heard of Trace Atkins. If you listen to mainstream country on the radio on yes. your dial in yes. your car, exactly. Okay. All right, guys, I have prepared. A mid-podcast pop quiz for you. Are you ready? No. No. <laughs> no, pass. No. You are to Trace tell Adkins. me which of the following is not an actual Trace Adkins song. <laughs> so are you ready? All right. All right. Still a soldier. Just fishing. <laughs> Honky tonk badonka donk. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's 100% a real song. Yeah. I'm actually aware You don't of have that. the creativity to come up with that. Or brown chicken, brown cow. Those are all Trace Adkins. Okay, songs. I feel like, yeah, I feel like you're trying to trick us with brown chicken, brown cow. Like, that's something you said, like, hats. But it's actually, <laughs> he was like, brown chicken, brown cow. And he yep. his song. It's all of them, I bet. It's I agree. all of them. Correct. Yep, you so. guys both got it right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to change the format of our show. No, no, but... I get it. I, it's, it's, it, was worth, it was worth going after. <laughs> And oh, and and to um, underscore the brilliant parallels that they're doing to a Christmas Carol, Michael Moore at this point asks how his little nephew Timmy is doing. Oh, tiny Tim. Timmy, there you go. You got yeah. it. Yeah, Timmy, Timmy. Timmy has crutch, right? Yeah, he'll have a crutch later. But the beautiful thing about this movie is they don't heal Timmy 
because this movie is nope. against people getting help. So this movie, we'll get to it, but this movie ends with Timmy still sick. It does. It does. Fuck you, Timmy. Get some bootstraps. Well, Timmy, it's a capitalist system for healthcare. Go fuck yourself. The end. Yep. Christmas. Well, this this movie also has this weird thing where it has to like redeem this character of Michael Moore, but also they still hate Michael Moore at the end of the movie, so they can't give him any pathos or anything. <laughs> it's it's quite a corner to write yourself into. So okay. So then Michael Moore goes to a snooty Heath and Eli restaurant to meet his agent. It was James Woods. Ugh. At least like with James Woods and John Voight, like at least I already knew not to like them, right? Yeah. Honestly, I think maybe this should have been the first movie we ever reviewed on God Awful <laughs> Movies. I feel like where I would have been a lot ready for the rest of my seven year career path. Fair. If this was episode one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but James Wood, his agent, is there to complain about how nobody likes the top grossing documentary of all time. Yeah. yeah. They don't even count. They're not like real films like checks James Woods' IMDb page. Rudy, the Rudy Giuliani biopic. Oh, Jesus not Christ. Rudy Rudiger, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the other one. Correct. This is where I just went and Googled James Woods to see if he's dying of COVID. I was crossed my finger. He's not. He's not dying. No. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So, yeah, but but of course, we have to establish here that Michael Moore dreams of making real movies instead of documentaries. He wants to be just like David Zucker when he grows up. <laughs> I'll have you know, I was one third of Airplane, a movie that is not great on rewatch, it's but it's, 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 it's that great was, for me. It's great for me. It's pretty fucking great. It's pretty fucking great. I learned nothing. But yeah, so but he has a new script he wants to make. He wants to make a, a a real picture called Fascist America. They couldn't even come up with like like at least come up with like a pun title of a existing movie that anyway yeah. Oh, how many tear and sweat stained days were there in the writers' room where they were like, "Come on, guys, the they come up with puns all the time. We can do." <laughs> <laughs> they even have them in their podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, and then we have to have the scene where we, we the award show scene where we're Ooh. like, yeah, oh, he may have won an Oscar, but psh, Oscar, schmoscar. It was for a document. That doesn't count. Nobody likes the documentary Oscars. Genuinely, the fox who can't reach the grapes would have turned to this movie and been like, all right, guys, we we get it. You're, <laughs> you're, you're bitter and sad. Ghost won an Oscar. Didn't Ghost win an Oscar? <laughs> I showed up to the party, but he must not have heard that I was there because uh, he didn't. didn't let me in. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think I'm his brother, but he still didn't let me in. I think there was a power outage right when I got there. It was <laughs> weird. <laughs> oh, uh, Paris Hilton is also in this. So, you know, they, they went top notch. She's one of the award presenters. Ugh. Yeah. So in case you didn't already, like, I mean, you should, I feel like you were already on board for hating Paris Hilton, but you know, and yeah, in case you were still looking for the straw to break that camel's back. This is also where they make their first liberals love the Nazis joke. Yeah. That one aged well. Yeah. I mean, this kind of goes to Heath's best worst. This is a, uh, you know, they're really laying all their chips on. We'll never be Nazis. I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly won't make up our base. Rough. Yeah. Right. And then so Michael Moore wins the Oscar, you know, Schmoscar or whatever the hell that it is that they're that they're giving him here. But the writers couldn't come up with a funny bit to do with his acceptance speech, so they just immediately play him off. Yep. And it's like nobody cares about God, this movie should have played itself off. They <laughs> oh God. <laughs> But then Kevin Sorbo gets up. Yes. Kevin. So he's also not dying of COVID. I checked. Yeah. Wow. And then the movie, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, the movie defends McCarthyism. Well, okay. Uh, <sighs> um, <laughs> This is another best worst. Yes. McCarthyism. He says he gives a speech. Kevin Sorbo stands up. He gives a speech and he says that McCarthyism, slavery and Nazis do not exist anymore. Yep. They don't exist. And then he says the real problem is Muslim people. Remember just before I said that McCarthyism doesn't exist. We should put all the Muslim people on a list or something to make it safe for us. 
hunt them all out. Some of them are witches, actually, technically. <laughs> Fuck. They did not hear it. Yep. So, yeah, so, and then we go to the after party where none of the lovely ladies care about the Oscar winner for documentary because nobody likes his movies, not like Airplane that they really enjoy and like. Okay, but this this is my favorite ADR moment in the movie. The actress is supposed to get distracted. So here's what happens in the scene. He's trying to talk up the girl. Then she sees Kevin Sorbo and she's like, ooh, is that uh, whatever Kevin Sorbo's character's name is? I'm going to go talk to him. But they could not pay that actress enough to say Kevin Sorbo is hot. So she just says, ooh, and then with her mouth closed, like Heath doing a lady voice is like, oh, is that Kevin Sorbo? He's so pretty. <laughs> I didn't catch that. Oh, no. I, I, I'm never going to watch another frame of this fucking movie again, so I'll just have to take your word for it. But yeah. Yeah, this is not on, a, this is not a rewatch. This is not a visit back. So, yeah, and then, of course, it's at this after party that... Ahmed and Mohammed, the the two uh, wacky terrorist henchmen, are going to approach Michael Moore about directing their new terrorist training video. Yeah. Which is kind of the plot. That's the plot of the movie. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, kind of. So Aziz, who is the main terrorist, comes to him at this point and says he's got a new terrorism plan. Spoiler alert, that'll be blowing up the big Trace Adkins concert at, at Madison Square Garden. But apparently that plan still relies on them convincing Michael Moore that he's going to direct a movie for them. It's like they're arguing about what the movie is about as they're making the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it really is. Oh, so and then, of course, we cut to like that night. He's at home. He's watching entertainment tonight eating a sad tv dinner because you know he, i know his movie made a hundred million dollars plus but but uh, but you know he's he's probably eats sad tv dinners michael moore probably sits alone at home and everyone and he, he always hears all the stuff we say about him <laughs> he hears it <laughs> yes yeah right the entertainment tonight is just going like michael moore is such a fucking loser he's a loser he's a fat stupid loser and he's like oh you wanted to be mainstream and so you settled for the far right but then you realized that you were trapped there and the further down you dug the worse and smaller it got and then the money disappeared and the money has <laughs> disappeared ever since and you find yourself sort of just like medium lower class just fighting against a tide of progress and realizing that you're ever more instilling yourself into the history as a hey, villain hey, hey. <laughs> you're uh you're weeping I mean, smush, smush his face in chili. There you go. <laughs> How many times should we do that? Three. Three. Let's do three. Yeah. Zeitgeist to three. <laughs> Rule of thrice. <laughs> so, yeah. So we cut to him meeting with Ahmed and, and Muhammad. We hear the fucking not touching, can't get mad of Seinfeld themes. <laughs> Bing. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, and, and they introduced the bit that Ahmed will always be slamming Muhammad's face into various things through this movie when he says the wrong thing, and, and that's going to be a running bit. And when I say that's the funniest part of the movie, please don't misinterpret that as that's funny. It's just, <laughs> there's a bar. It's just a welcome relief. You have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Relative. Yep. It means they're not talking about what they think. <laughs> that's nice for me. Oh, and this is also where the writers reveal this amazing vehicle that they're going to use because sometimes they want to talk about what a fat asshole idiot Michael Moore is, but it doesn't fit into the script. So once in a while, they'll just have the kids who are being told this story by Leslie Nielsen and sort of the superstructure of the film cut in and say, boy, that character sure is a fat idiot, isn't he? Who sucks. Yep. And that's this is the first time that happens. And I'm just like, that was, really? That was how this writer's room had to get their words into the mouth yes. of somebody on the screen was to have the little kids say it. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Oh. Wow. That's rough. So late that night, he, he wraps up his conversation with those guys. He agrees to make their movie. He doesn't know it's a terrorist movie yet. Very important to the plot. But late that night, he's sitting in bed watching TV when a thing about JFK comes on. And he's we've established in the movie he he loves JFK. That's his hero. Right. Yeah. So JFK is now going to 
Lecture Michael Moore about how he actually loved the Vietnam War. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, JFK steps through the TV, the ring style and starts lecturing Michael Moore on the true meaning of patriotism. I don't know what I hate most about this scene. The fact that they take truly one of the better political speeches of the 20th century and reinterpret as let's get them good. Yeah. Or the fact that they hired an actor who can't do a JFK impersonation, the easiest impersonation to do in the world. <laughs> aw, this is it. Aw, you just, you literally just make the noise aw, and you are doing, <laughs> do it right now. You're, You're in your car. Go ahead. Aw, oh, you just did it, right? You oh, yeah, that sounded pretty good, right? Aw. Oh. And if you think that they had to go with somebody that looked like JFK, they didn't get that either. It's not, nope. it's not like they, they sacrificed the one for the other. He doesn't look any more like JFK than I do. Yeah. So, yeah, but, but he's going to be the Jacob Marley of this, of this film. He, he explains that, uh, Michael Moore's not patriotic enough. And this night he'll be visited by three spirits because, they don't really have original ideas for this. Right. God, they, th J they think JFK is on the Republican side of 2008? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> JFK would murder this movie with a gun if yes. he could. Yep. Yeah. The marginal tax rate for the highest bracket was like 90% under Kennedy. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, when he murdered them with a gun, they would say, see, he was pro-gun. <laughs> JFK would invite this movie to sit behind him during a parade <laughs> hey you know what y'all can have bolt action rifles once in a while there yeah, you go go for it all right well apparently this movie has bumbled its way into a plot and rarely have we more thoroughly earned a break so we're going to take one but unfortunately we'll be back in a minute with even more of an American Carol I don't think they should have bolt action rifles either. I don't think they should have. No, no, you can't trust them. None. They should have none. Oh, man. I don't know if I can finish this. You have to, dude. Protein. I know. I know. Hey, guys. What you doing? What's with the uh, goop? Uh, I've been trying to get more protein in my diet, but chugging these things is disgusting. There's got to be a better way. I mean, you could just try Magic Spoon cereal. The one with all the flavors from when I was a kid? That stuff has protein in it? 13 to 14 grams of it and only four net carbs. Wow. So I could get my protein from flavors like cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter instead of this thing? You sure could. All right, Noah, I'm in. Where do I sign up? Just go to magicspoon.com slash gam to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code gam at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed by a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash gam and use the code gam to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Wow, you hear that, Heath? I don't need you to blend up any more Victoria's Secret magazines for this stuff after all. Eli, I don't think he was grinding up. Uh, up, 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 up. Stop there. Want to get paid for the ad. Oh, yep, Thank you. sure do. That is fair. Michael, Michael Moore, it is I, JFK, the great national hero, and I have something to teach you about the real meaning of patriotism. Oh, uh, you? Y you sure? I mean... Yeah, why, why not uh, me? I, it's just, I mean, Bay of Pigs. Uh, I was stopping the threat of communism. By an unsanctioned illegal attempt to overthrow a government. I, 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 so. Communism was really scary, though. So. so Also, there's like a ton of evidence you were connected to the mob. Your family provided a front to the Catholic Church when they were raping kids. I mean, speaking of family, don't even get me started on what... Robert's kid is up to these days. Okay, okay, maybe I wasn't perfect, but I loved America, and that is what I'm here to teach you. You remember America shot you in the head, right? Okay, well, that might have been the mob. The American mob, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit, and we're going to rejoin the action with Michael Malone waking up and heading out to that big anti- july 4th protest he was gonna do oh yeah now now they're gonna take on students who don't want army recruiters on campus yeah right and i i've got up i have to point out that's in their own movie right that's what he's protesting he's protesting army recruiters on campus and then they refer to that as a demonstration against the troops 
Like even in their own movie, that's a ridiculous exaggeration of what they they could have him demonstrating against the troops if they wanted. Right. It's their fucking move. You've you've smashed a terrorist's face into chili three times. It's okay to do your all the way fascist fantasies, right? Yeah. <sighs> so we we see the crowd of of demonstrators that have come to listen to Michael Moore talk, and and of course they're all holding signs about. Right wing conspiracy theories. Yeah. <laughs> Heathleton's best worst coming in strong on these signs. <laughs> the left and all their 9 11 truthers, you know. <sighs> okay. Okay. Well, that was, that was a bad example. Well, the nine, I mean, like they, they had the tinfoil hats and the, I mean, yeah. yeah. Inside job. <laughs> we, <have> t- <laughs> we shot those planes down. We did not. <laughs> so, yeah. And then they try to do again this. Here's my best worst again. They try to do this bit where like everything he says, the people will chant back to him. And so he can't get through his speech, but they don't they don't have any idea how to escalate that. So it's just yeah. that joke over and over and over again until he says, uh, guys, this joke is played out. Stop doing it. <laughs> Stop doing it. Stop doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I do love this, though. Like, this is fun. when chanters can't get it right. I'm generally in favor of what chanters at protests are going for philosophically. But when they can't get the chant right because like the leader did something that's a little too complicated, has like mm-hmm. two clauses instead of one or it's got, it's got like a double negative and everybody's like, don't not now. Shit. It, it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny when you can't get it. But once again, they, they frisbee in the face this one. They managed to make something that's naturally funny, unfunny. Yeah. So and then, of course, the the crowd sees something that they like more than him because everybody hates him and nobody really likes him. So they run over top of him and they smoosh his face into the ground. They step on his face, fat face, face. <laughs> <laughs> they really do that. <sighs> and then this is where we meet the first of his July 4th Christmas ghosts. They won't bother with the whole present, future, past notion here. But this is... Kelsey Grammer playing the part of General Patton. Yeah, famous right-wing idiot who people think is smart because of the liberal writers who wrote him for 87 years. Kelsey Grammer. Oh, right. God. He's so he's so shitty. It's the worst. I wanted I wanted him to get roasted by the just somebody in the movie just be like, hey, "You really got carried by David Hyde Pierce technically." <laughs> just like somebody in the crowd, "Come on." Say say an original thought that wasn't written for you by the people who also wrote Cheers and a bunch of the good sitcoms that everyone likes. Yeah. I'll wait. I'll wait back here. Right. <laughs> B.B. Newirth just shows up and yells at <laughs> him. <laughs> Me and David really carried you. Fuck you. <laughs> All right, I'm done. So, and then they have the Patton character slap Michael Moore. Now, I want to be super clear to people who don't know the history. The joke there with, with the slap, with the repeated slaps, is about how Patton used to physically abuse soldiers for having PTSD. Yep. That's the joke. This is a pro PTSD <sighs> film. Well, it's a pro they should just walk it off film. Yeah, about PTSD. Yes. <sighs> and then to shit on peace protests more, we do sort of a doodly do like General Patton carries him through the doodly do portal to a protest against World War II because you know, peace demonstrators of Hitler. Yeah. You remember all those peaceniks that were against World War II. Well, look, there were plenty of people demonstrating in America against World War II. I think the real lesson that you should take there, though, is that the bullshit propaganda that they used against Germany in World War I was so ridiculously silly that no one would believe anything they said about Hitler afterwards. But okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, every war is not World War II. Right. Also, I think that's also important. They're saying the message of the movie is like, well, you can't protest wars because Hitler. Yeah. What? One might argue none of the wars except World War II was World War II. Yep. And that's been our problem for a while now. And for World War II, let's keep in mind, it was a fucking sequel. Right? So yep. th- that war is good because of World War II nonsense that the right likes to drum up. Forgets that if we had had some fucking peaceniks before World War I running the goddamn show, there wouldn't have been a World War II. No, nah, I'm going to stop you right there. You're putting nuance into this. Noah, you're Hitler. You <laughs> are Adolf Hitler. Yeah, Noah, you sound a lot like Neville Chamberlain, famous <laughs> coward and pussy. 
oh yeah no they nail the uh, the nuance on the Neville Chamberlain they they literally have him like polishing Hitler's boots yeah I wrote in my notes man being a Nazi bootlicker got a lot more popular among Republicans in the last yes. 13 years didn't it <laughs> <laughs> And I, I described in my notes, I described their understanding of this whole situation as history at a coloring book level. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the message of this scene is talking to evil dictators gets you nothing. And I wrote in my notes, hey, look at me agreeing with the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, they bring us back in time here. And at one point we're in Nazi Germany, I guess. So this movie put up giant swastika curtains in New York City to shoot a thing that happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They like these. I I don't want to know how that all. Like they somebody owned that and they were like, oh no, no no I got it I got it and they they hung these things down in New York City. Kelsey Grammer brought his from home. Somebody brought those from home. One hundred percent. David Hyde Pierce beat me up for having these. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I did enjoy about this scene though is that. Kevin Farley gets slapped in the face a bunch, not just by Kelsey Grammer, by like everybody. I started to theorize to myself that the way they got people into to like agree to be in this movie is that you get to slap Kevin Farley. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Whenever you want. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah. okay, so this I mean, this is the airplane guy. He has he has one this this is one this is him doing his joke as a line now and he just kept doing slapping. Yep. Here's the thing though. We could hire Kevin Farley and just slap him for two hours. Yeah, I feel like we could. I feel like we absolutely could. Six shooting days. All right. So this is take seven. Me and Heath need to slap you in exact synchronicity. If it's <laughs> off by even a second, we're going to have to do another take. All right. One, two, three. You went on three, Eli. You went on four. Three. Clap. Four. <laughs> we're doing three. Five. One, clap. <laughs> two. Okay. Start again. We're going to start again. One, two. Slap. Slap. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, and of course, on their end, the point of all of this is that we get to see Michael Moore get slapped, right? As a matter uh, of fact, that in this scene, we get to see him thrown out of a window. Yep. No, but we get we get to see Kevin Farley. Well, yeah, I mean, right, but they happened, get to fun. see Michael Moore thrown out of a window. <laughs> oh, and then we, this is probably the worst argument the movie makes. Then we bam over to Alabama Seeing as how he's against the war and everything, that must mean he's in favor of slavery because it took a war to end that. Who are they? Who are they <laughs> arguing against? What? Who? Who are they responding to? My note here was just like nobody, nothing, and then <laughs> this movie, slavery is bad. Who said? Who? What are you talking? Well, but the, none of that. But see, he that's because war is a good thing. Now, if there was some country out there that abolished slavery without a war, that would fuck up this point pretty pretty harsh. No, <laughs> but everyone had a giant civil war. Exactly. That they, All that the still countries. still divides the country to this day. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you're against war, you love slavery. What's more, if you're against war, you would have been a slave owner and a mean one. You would have raped them a lot and beat them. You're slaves. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. I don't feel bad for almost anyone in this movie, but you know who I feel bad for? Oh, God. David Allen Greer and Gary Coleman, who play the slaves God. in this scene. Yeah, well, and all the extras in the in the back doing their cotton picking. Yeah, man. I also have a question. I have a question and a statement and a thesis and a religion. Mm -hmm. Why do they sing Hava Nagila? I have no fucking idea. This this was a weird anti-Semitism moment, I think. Was it? Okay. I was curious about that. Like, my my question was, which bigotry is this? <laughs> when they have a bunch of their slave characters sing Hava Nagila. <laughs> I think it was a bigotry-ception. Like, if you've ever talked to an, a bigot on Twitter, and then you just, you get bored with whatever argument they're pretending to make, and so you're like, what color's the sky? And they're just like, gray, because the Jews ruined it with their blood money. Yep. That's yeah. the level of joke we've reached in this film. I mean, which bigotry is this is is honestly the, sort of the underwriting question of the entire movie, though, right? <laughs> there, there should be a game show for this for the cast of this movie. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was going to say, I already pulled this out of our format once. Otherwise, I totally should have prepared a quiz. Which bigotry is this? <laughs> Antisemitism. Uh, yeah. Pass. Uh, <laughs> And so from that very uncomfortable scene, we then bamf over to the Lincoln Memorial for a quick rising strings moment about the glory of war. 
Jesus fucking Christ. The thing that Abraham Lincoln wanted super a lot and didn't spend years trying to prevent was war. Yep. Yep. Sure did love him some war. And then, of course, Michael Moore gets a call from his protester later. He, this is still, you know, this is still the first of the three ghosts. He's not convinced yet. So he's going to head over to Columbia University to give his big anti-war speech. Now, this movie cannot decide if we're in a doodly do, what the rules of the doodly do are, what is and is not a dream. So he's going to walk from Washington, D.C. over to Columbia University for this, apparently. Yep. It's the District of Columbia, Noah. That's where it is. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> So, oh, and then we go into this college and we get the we get the musical number. Yep. A musical number about how dumb and corrupt higher education is. Right. So the conceit of this entire song is that nothing has changed in the world of college and science and learning and stuff in the last 50 years. They're still on about the same shit they were in 1968. That's the conceit of the whole. Their audience is religious. Yes. Their argument <laughs> is that professors today are as wrong as they were in 1968. Yeah, I believe this movie is coming out as pro Kent State murders. Well, certainly pro Vietnam War, right? Yep. Because that's like specifically what they're talking about. They're still on about that dumb piece of shit like they were back in 1968. Mm. Yeah, the concept of evil was similar for a long time. This is a weird <laughs> problem to have. Like, you've been against evil the same way this whole time. Oh, yeah. Boring. Can you believe our political party has been the bad guy for 50 fucking years? <laughs> yeah. Well, the Republican ideas literally went backwards since 1968. Yeah, right. It's yeah, worse true. now. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's also a line in the song that talks about how easy the world is on poor gay black people and how hard it is on Christians. Yep. Especially elite universities. Those are famously oh, easy yeah. on poor gay and black people. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, gay joke, gay joke, gay joke. College is stupid. And then the song wraps up and Michael Moore turns to Kelsey Grammer. He's like, all right, no, that was a pretty good point. <laughs> What? <laughs> what was a pretty good point? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, I'm still against torture, though. So pro torture. So the movie is pro torture? Yes. Yep. The movie's pro torture. Yep. I'm just going to say it one more time. The movie is in favor of torturing. It's I don't even know that that's the worst thing it'll be in favor of before we're done. But yes, the whole like, all right, but I'm not down with torture yet. This movie will be like, oh, we'll come back to that. But first, we have to have a flashback to where we see how it all went wrong for Michael Moore. Now, this does not tell us anything about the character. This does not set up anything that's funny later. This does not move us along in the plot at all. What this scene exists for is so that the makers of this movie can go, and I bet his girlfriend was fucking other dudes. Right? Amazing. <laughs> I, I can't think of any other thing that this scene is doing in the movie. Yep. It is, it is literally a fantasy, a fantasy burn against Michael Moore <laughs> that is not based on truth. No. Right? They might as well be like, I know how it started. I bet you got a big wedgie. And one time, one time after that party where all the lights went out, I met you in the parking lot and I was like, don't make me use my super risk control karate on you. And you were like, you won't. And then I did. And it was so, it was so good. And I did control your wrist so hard. <laughs> yeah. There's, so what, what, what we see is Michael Moore as like a 17 year old and he's like, I'm going to go away to film school. We're still going to be together, right, girlfriend? And then she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Minutes later, he walks away and she's fucking a military guy. Yeah. That, and so the movie's saying, like, <laughs> your girlfriend fucked some other guy because of your, like, liberal views on tax policy or you went to fucking yep. film school to do art or whatever instead of going into the military like a real man would. Yeah. And I feel like she fucked the other guy because he's very attractive. Like He's I'm, pretty, we, pretty we're, good looking. We're looking at it. Yeah. He's very attractive. Seems it, like there's a, another reason. Kind of like Kelsey Grammer's ex-wife did. Just, <laughs> if we're being honest. And hey, if there's anything we know, it's that the wife of service men and women never cheat on them. So. 
excellent burn movie. <laughs> well, yeah. They, again, the movie's trying to have it both ways, right? Because she marries the the military guy, but also they make a joke about how she's a slut and fucks everybody who's in a uniform. Right. So I did. They again, they, they can't even decide. And again, them shitting on their own concept as they walk out the door. There's just like a line of guys with like chocolates and they're all in like increasingly silly uniforms. But they can't come up with enough silly uniforms. to. The last guy in the line is a firefighter. Right. They can't even they can't even pay off that bit. Yep. Ugh. All right. So so then we cut to the the terrorists. They're planning to attack the Trace Adkins concert. Yep. This is where Michael Moore shows up, and apparently they need him to get them backstage passes, which apparently he can get because he's a documentarian. This is what the movie is about now. We yep. want backstage passes to blow up the Trace Adkins concert. Which, by the way, they won't go backstage to do. No. No. <laughs> no. If you blow up a trace at, you know what? I don't want to finish that. <laughs> There's a time travel based argument. <laughs> well, and, and so and Michael Moore shows up at this point, right? Cause he's about to be interviewed or whatever. And there seems to be this bit, like they go up in the elevator to get together. And there's this bit where he's like, ah, you know, you guys look like a bunch of terrorists. Get it? That's what a racist would say. So like the movie seems to be making a joke that liberals are so stupid that they don't assume that everyone of Middle Eastern heritage is a terrorist. Yep. There is this awesome thing. I, I hate to use the word awesome in any way related to this movie, mm -hmm. but there is this awesome thing sometimes where they'll, they'll be like, that's what you think. And we're like, yeah, man, what do you think? And they're like, nothing stupid. Which we didn't think Rosie O'Donnell is fat. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. Okay. So then we get the most clear, shower argument of the film right this is the interview with bill o'reilly yes they got the the real bill o'reilly <laughs> papa bear himself and they have a fake rosie o'donnell for this bit too she's rosie o'connell totally yeah. get it very clever and they're gonna like you know win an argument against their nephew in this scene <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is also the best like planting your flag and that would never happen because they start talking about radical Christian terrorism. Can you imagine if Christians were the terrorists? The, okay, th this was so fucking bad. I'm sorry, it's hard to make humor out of this movie. It's so fucking awful. I, I have to keep pointing out that. So yeah, they have this whole bit of like, you know, Muslims are terrorists. Christians aren't terrorists. And they, they show shtick. They're like, could you imagine what that would look like? And I'm like, God, there was, there's footage in the public domain of the Oklahoma City bombing. I, I literally wrote this was post Oklahoma City bombing. You could have just done that. But no, instead the joke is all about how it's apparently Muslims fault that their scared asses are overreacting to the existence of Muslims. Ah, uh, yes. The TSA, that very successful program caused by, look, checks notes, Muslim, <laughs> so. which is why every country in the world has that insane security theater. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. But but at this point, they're blaming the thing they're afraid of for them being afraid of it mm -hmm. and for the ways that they've inconvenienced everyone because of their unjustified terror. Yep. But we're doing so in the in the form of a Bill O'Reilly interview where he's totally poning Michael Moore, which he totally could do. He didn't, but he would have. Totally could do. Bill O'Reilly was so bad at his job that his ability to turn off other people's microphones wasn't enough. So he needed to create a double fake construct of the two <laughs> Hollywood celebrities who regularly made him look like an idiot on national <laughs> television. <laughs> yep. Well, and then like his fucking... His got her line for Rosie O'Connell after she's done is, yeah, no, you're right. We might as well just put you in the Pinhead Hall of Fame. Huh? It's, it's Pinhead is, it, I, I say that a lot. It's my thing. It's like my. It's an insult. It's because her head would be very small. I'm actively sexually harassing women and covering it up right now. Yeah. Like on <laughs> the set movie, of this movie. As almost this movie certainly. is yeah. being made. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so but Bill O'Reilly tells it to Michael Moore how it really is. And then he goes back to the office so that somebody can run up to him and say, hey, this 
this isn't where this next scene is. It's actually at a rehearsal for your movie. So go there. <laughs> like, motherfucker. Start your real scene. Why are you right. pump faking scenes at me? <laughs> uh, this is fucking exhausting. I'm watching this forever. Just start your scene. Don't make me God. write down two locations, you fucking assholes. <laughs> but yeah, so we go to the, they're, they're rehearsing the, the movie that he's supposed to be making. And I don't even know. It's just stupid, racist nonsense for. Wait. Yeah. A very important thing happens. There's a racist like, oh, this is what liberals think is real. And then I believe, because my pet theory is that Leslie Nielsen's dementia subsided for a moment. <laughs> Leslie Nielsen's <laughs> dementia subsided. The actor, he grabbed a sword and tried and rightly tried to kill everyone involved with this movie. And they kept it in. Yeah, well, yeah. Leslie Nielsen just runs into the middle of the scene, starts hacking at people with what we're led to believe is a real sword that he's really killing people with during the rehearsal. There's no reason for this, right? They're, they're just trying to be wacky. Yeah. And then he, and then he just runs off and that, that's it. That's that. So is he swinging the sword around with a bunch of kids next to him at a barbecue in the, the reality part? No, he has entered the world of the movie. <laughs> He added himself to the story, a la... He's inside the podcast of her. He's he, he became part of the... Okay, yeah. so earlier, was he singing Hava Nagila in his impression <laughs> of a slave Ooh, at that barbecue? Oh, yes. Very uncomfortable. With a black lady that he hit in the face with a frisbee yeah. right next to him. <laughs> right. Right. Explains the presence of a sword. And then with all the connective tissue of a toddler telling you a joke, Kelsey Grammer shows back up and he's like, the courthouse uh, across the street's under attack. That's where the next scene is. This is, I'm going to argue that this is the craziest part of the movie mm -hmm. because this is where they just openly fantasize about murdering the ACLU. Yep. Yes. Yeah, they don't even disguise this, right? So they go into the courthouse and it turns out that there are ACLU lawyers. The, the ACLU lawyers are zombies, so they're allowed to shoot him in the face. And then we just watch for like five minutes as people shoot ACLU lawyers in the face. Yep. Dennis Hopper is there. He he shoots ACLU lawyers. Oh, God, this is it's so sad. This is the last movie Dennis Hopper ever did before he died. Is it really? It is. Yes. Oh. You were in fucking Easy Rider, man. And you closed it out <laughs> with... An American, American Carol. Girl. At least Leslie Nielsen did like three other shitty movies in between. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. You can tell Dennis Hopper's family desperately tried to cover this because when you look at IMDb, they have added like clip from a documentary. They showed it on <laughs> TBS in, in 2014. <laughs> we played ping pong at Thanksgiving and we took a little video on the phone <laughs> we did a little with him. <laughs> you can see he's in the background there. See, he's the one holding the cup. Right there, you can see his hand. Oh, people, Hopper, why? <laughs> why didn't we watch you more closely? Well, and then, but so here's the fucked up, most fucked up thing about this scene about murdering ACLU lawyers. They're trying to, like, establish that the ACLU has gone too far and they're doing all this detrimental shit. What they show the evil ACLU zombies doing is taking a Ten Commandments display down from a courtroom. <laughs> That's the nightmare they came up with. Yeah. And to be clear, they're they're murdering the ACLU here. So they're saying we will murder to stop the ACLU from taking down a sign that says don't murder. Yes. That's what they're saying. Yeah. They even wink at that very fact within the scene. Yeah. They Yeah. They pretend that they're aware of that, but they don't know how they're aware of that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. They the judge in this scene just said murdering lawyers sure is fun and productive and then winked at us. And not for nothing. Andrew makes me edit shit like that out when Eli does it. So, I mean, on the other side of the bench, that is. But still, I have complaints. So I, I feel like I need to take a quick break and talk to Andrew. But first, let me act through the hard sell. Will Michael Moore learn his lesson before I rip my eyes out of my goddamn head? How severe of an injury would I have to inflict on myself before Heath and Eli would give me the episode off? <laughs> Is Kellogg still hiring? <laughs> Find out what other questions I ask myself when we return for the blemish on the very medium of film that is an American Carol. Hey, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And I'm No Illusions. If we've learned anything from this show, it's that you enjoy our suffering. But did you know that there's even more of our pain available for our patrons? 64 bonus episodes worth. 
That's right, Heath. For as little as a dollar a show, you can listen to us suffer through 64 of the worst secular movies cinema has to offer, including the Zack Snyder Justice League, Troll 2, and just so many Adam Sandler movies. Toss it a couple bucks more a show, and you get your very own home game version of Christian Movie Bingo shipped right to your door. And higher levels get free tickets to live shows. And don't forget high-quality versions of all the songs Anna writes for the show. But most of all, you'll have our sweet, sweet suffering, which we can only assume makes you young through some kind of satanic pact. So head on over to patreon.com slash godawful and drink our tears through your ear holes. Patreon, our pain is your pleasure. I That's a different Patreon's catchphrase. It means something totally different. Yep, yep. Just Googled it. It is different. Oh, send me that link. And we're back for yet still more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the movie, pointing out what an awesome policy stop and frisk was. Pro stop and frisk and pro shooting a teenager in the back. Yep. Because mm-hmm. he looks like a terrorist. Okay, but he did have a bomb. He was he a terrorist. Did, he, so the it cop turns out- guessed correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so you're allowed to shoot him in retrospect. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is a policy that's always going to work out for us here at the NYPD. Yeah, right. Well, so and that's the whole conceit of the thing, right? Because we're coming from the ACLU zombie lawyer thing. Now they go down into the subway and the cops are like, oh, these these fucking Muslims look pretty suspicious. Let's check and see what they're carrying. But then the ACLU lawyers make them not do that. So, again, just fucking unapologetic defense of racism. Yep. Right. And the message here is like, okay, well, good luck stopping all those subway bombers in New York City that you have a problem that that happens a lot. There's a lot of bombs that go off in New York City subway because the ACLU. Yeah, right. Yeah. Once again, the movie's like, all right, but I I guarantee you within a couple of years, this thing that'll never happen will happen. Yeah. All right. So Patton and and Michael Moore are, are, are leaving the subway. And he's, you know, of course, at this point in the movie, he has to like start to be convinced, but they haven't made any points yet. Yeah. So he's going like, all right, well, look, I understand what you're saying. It's like stop and frisk is fucking awesome. I get it. But it's not like I'm against. And this is his actual list. It's not like I'm against Santa Claus or Boy Scouts or religion. (laughs) <laughs> like that, that those are the things they're saying that the liberal that, that would be too far for us to go I'm like are you just trying to make sure you get on the main feed guys <laughs> okay <laughs> and just to be clear the point they're making here is the big problem at country music concerts is going to be the plot here the big problem at country music concerts is muslim terrorism yep <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. no shit that's what they're saying here. yep they're wrong they're wrong about every point they make like they might as well be like john mccain's gonna be president next month and he will never have face cancer it's gonna be great <laughs> we're never gonna have health it's so stupid well and so yeah so then we doodly do over to the cookout that his nephew was trying to invite him to and this is the first and not the last time that a character in this movie will say see now we're in the real america and then show a big crowd of entirely white people. Sure will. Yep, that lady who got hit with the Frisbee, she is not in this shot. Nope, <laughs> she sure isn't. He says, welcome to the real America, as opposed to New York City. Right, right. That's where they just left. Now they're in the real America, a cookout in the suburbs, entirely filled with white people. Although you got to admit, there is something deeply American about claiming the real America is a group of 25 white people and not the busiest multicultural center in the country. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. The That's only- our entire electoral system you just described. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boy, isn't it? In many ways, the real America. Yeah. And then so we, we have to have a parade of ever more disappointed relatives talk about how much they hate Michael Moore and wish he was dead and he's fat and he's stupid. And they do this in the form of like ever more disabled children because I think disabilities are funny. I don't. Did Michael Moore in real reality like not finance a cornea and like a a kidney for some children famously? Did he refuse no. children these things? Not that I heard of. He he did make a movie about how those people deserve health care. So I I do remember that I could see how it would be tricky for this movie to walk the line of showing disabled children without eliciting too much sympathy. (laughs) (laughs) 
which was indeed their goal. Well, so, so much of it, because their positions are so toxically shitty, so much of what they have to argue in this movie is that we don't really believe in our positions, right? We, we want health care for everybody, but we wouldn't really spend our fortune giving corneas to children. There's a scene in there with, with, when we were at the Schmaskers, right? There was the scene where they're like, we're against world hunger, and then they show everybody eating food. Huh, really committed <laughs> to the bit, aren't they? Yeah. Can you imagine saying you're against hunger and eating food? Hypocrites. Total right. hypocrites. Over and over again, this movie has to do that because it can't argue that like everyone having access to health care is bad <laughs> which and i'm just gonna say it i was surprised they didn't argue with that in this movie yeah true fair fair but yeah so everybody comes out and, and talks about how he's an asshole and then we step through a fog portal right into the war in afghanistan Sorry, I'm just looking at my list of good things that the movie hasn't shit on yet. Did we do the literal Geneva Accords? Yes, um, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're going to go. But we, we, remember I put a pin in torture earlier? They're, they are pro-torture, yes. Yeah. Not just torture. Like, don't shoot people War blindfolded where, they, where you have captured them on the ground. Right. Yeah. No, yes. We are, we are moving in into general. the pro-war crime portion of the film. Yes. Yeah, they come across a bunch of prisoners that are all blindfolded, and Michael Moore says, hey, you can't blindfold these prisoners. That's against the Geneva Convention. And they go, Geneva Convention, Schmaneva Convention. And then they start taking the blindfolds off. Now, th then everybody makes fun of how fat he is, and he puts the blindfolds back on him, as if to say, see, they don't really care about world hunger. They eat food. <laughs> <laughs> Yet again. But yeah, and then, of course, there's a battle and Michael Moore's a coward and he runs away. But all of the brave Christian Republicans charge into fight because they're badass. Yeah. Slow motion. -y. But was it OK? Wasn't a, a whole group of soldiers praying instead of doing real soldier stuff? Yep. And yeah. then while that was happening, a bunch of other soldiers got killed because yep. they, they weren't helping. Mm hmm. Well, but then they got done with their prayer, and then they went and did brave And then stuff. they went to go they, die. Yeah, yeah they so. they died too, they <laughs> promised. <laughs> what were you praying for in that? It's fine. It's fine. Please let these mortars stop so we can finish our prayers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, and so then we show up at St. Paul's Chapel in New York City. Patton is, is praising to God and apologizing for being unable to, like, ghost of July 4th past him into jingoism. Yep. I guess. Mm -hmm. And then this is also, I guess, where the movie realizes, holy fuck, we have to do two more ghosts, guys. Oh, God. <laughs> so we start speeding through that. George Washington shows up to be the ghost of Christmas present or July 4th present. Who the fuck? They're not keeping track. George Washington as played by John Voight. I almost went with best, best IMD fun fact. John Voight made up his own lines for this movie, and you can tell. Oh, God. Really? Yeah, he's like, okay, but I get to tell Michael Moore to fuck himself in my own words, right? <laughs> like, yeah, man, fine. But yeah, he gives this just ridiculous bumper stickery speech about the importance of freedom. Short of Heath being about to make a teenager cry in a southern church during an Ask an Atheist session. This is the worst Q&A I've ever witnessed. Jesus. He says, you're abusing freedom of speech. And he means by expressing political opinions contrary to his own. And as though John Voight realizes how weak his opinions are, he's like, you might notice it's dusty in here. Well, just so you know, that's the dust of 9-11. Yes, this is dead people dust. Show some respect. Yeah, he opens the door of the church and damn it if ground zero, like, you know, a day after the collapse isn't right out in front of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, remember when Republicans cared about 3,000 people dying? Uh, yeah, no shit. But the message here, and they, and they spell this out explicitly, is that 9-11 was the fault of liberals who were unwilling to take the threat of Muslim terrorists seriously enough. Yep. You know, like the liberal president that we had when 9-11 happened. Remember him? That, that famous <laughs> liberal, George <laughs> Bush Jr. Yeah, Jesus. and all the liberals who were running the NYPD and the U.S. military. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. All that, those ne nefariously liberal organizations, yeah. 
But yeah, and then, and then, apropos of nothing, John Voight turns to the Michael Moore character and says, by the way, you're going to burn in hell for your political opinions. Just so you know, fucking God is going to send you to hell and you're going to, your flesh is going to burn off and then he's going to put more flesh on you and then that's going to burn off. <laughs> Fuck you. Kevin, we need you to walk out of the scene. This is all John just <laughs> improvising. You walk out of the scene, buddy. <laughs> To be fair to John, his kid's fucked, so he's going through a tough time. Why don't you, <laughs> why don't you head on out of the scene? Yeah. And this is where Michael Moore is like, I was judged. You're talking about Judgment Day. I won an Oscar. And th this was actually funny. John Voight was the only person who said this funnily. He's like, yeah, but for a documentary, you won an Oscar for a documentary. <laughs> but Fahrenheit 9-11 had a profit of $216 million. This Jesus movie Christ. made negative $13 yep. million. <laughs> yep. Just for the record. So, yeah. And then, of course, we're speeding through our ghosts now. So he stumbles onto his own grave and he can see that he's going to die one day, which apparently he wasn't aware of until he saw the grave. And then Trace Adkins shows up and we're supposed to just fucking recognize him apparently <laughs> trace adkins trying to read his lines it doesn't make this movie worth it nothing could make this movie worth it oh no but trace adkins being like hello there i am the angle of d <laughs> why would i be the angle of d but but the line itself is not much better than the delivery here's the actual fucking line I'm the angel of freaking death, you turd head. Turd head Hall of Fame is where you're going to be, basically. <laughs> Stupid like head. Pin head, pins. but it's with turds. It's even worse. Knuckle. So <laughs> yeah, at this point, my notes just say, this movie hasn't changed my mind about politics, but it's definitely changed my mind about watching this movie. <laughs> yeah, no shit. But yeah, but Trace Adkins, I guess, is the ghost of July 4th future. So he takes him to the John Voight couldn't bother to take him any fucking where he had shit to do places to be. And he was making up his own lines as he went along. So he wandered off set <laughs> in his Georgia to go yell at the ice cream man about him burning in hell. I like that. That's this movie was originally an hour and 45, but John just wandered off and wouldn't read the lines. And so they had to cut 20 minutes of it. OK, all right. That makes sense. But Trace Adkins takes him to. The Hollywood of the future after it's been taken over by Muslim terrorists and turned into Os Osama bin Laden land instead of yeah. Hollywood. Okay, just to review, George Patton and George Washington were ghosts of past and now the cowboy guy is the future of a ghost. The, I, I was think there a present? Washington was supposed to be the present or maybe JFK 9-11 was the present. 9-11 the the is the ghost. Yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah. Do they know what? the time it's fine no nope. no no they don't that no nope. hey, here's a great thing about this movie if the question is do they know blank no no well especially no. do they know when they are oh hell no, no. They, they think they're back at a time when the everybody who's islamic is named mohammed joke was enough yeah that's fair yeah <sighs> so we go from fucking islam hollywood to michigan Right. So apparently in their future, don't worry, this is right around the corner. It's going to happen any minute now if the liberals get their way. Detroit is hit by a dirty bomb by terrorists. Hey, I'm just impressed that they could tell. All right, I, I'm from Detroit. I don't know how you would know. <laughs> but just Detroit? Why would who if you had a bomb, if you had a nuclear <laughs> device, who's like, all right, we're going to use our one. Well, because you, you have a head start there in Detroit. You, it's the you're gonna get. That's the true. <laughs> yeah, that the jar on that pickle has already been loosened. <laughs> I'm just saying, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of rubble already. Like we can. Yeah, really... we're just really there's a it's a whole city filled with shrapnel. Really, if you think about it. But then this is, I think, probably the worst of the, and then it'll get stepped on the head moments in the entire movie right because the scientists that are examining the remains of the dirty bomb have found michael moore's dismembered ass shooter mcgavin is one of the scientists by the way that's correct just throwing that out there okay all right i thought adam sandler was going to show up here just to spite noah like <laughs> it seemed like they were just adding more and more <laughs> horrible people dennis leary is going to give a speech somehow yeah right right the fact that a french lady 
didn't murder this whole cast at the premiere by burning the building down. It, <laughs> that's why I'm atheist. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's that's the pro that's the problem of evil right there. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. This movie is the problem of evil. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but they but so they all mock him for not being scared enough of Muslims. That was America's biggest problem in 2008 is that we weren't racist enough uh, against Middle Easterners. And they all play with the big prosthetic ass that someone had to make for this movie. And none of them have <laughs> so any stupid. space work. No. So they all just like <laughs> put it on their ass and they're like, it's it's like if I had an ass. Ass. I do, I mean, I do, I do though. I have an ass though. Yeah. You do ass work now. Go. One of them is like, <laughs> oh, well, let's put. Uh, uh, Michael Moore's signature baseball cap on it, but they, then they realize there's not like a logical place to put a baseball cap on an ass, and that you, you, we watched them realize that. Yeah, I thought I had you go. It's <laughs> come back to me. Sorry, I thought the fact that I was following John Voight and Trace Atkins means that I could do no wrong, but it turns out I can. I, I can believe do it or wrong. not, I can disappoint <laughs> even within this script. <laughs> But of course, this is where he wakes up and realizes it was all a dream. Don't worry, it wasn't. They don't know the rules of their own fucking doodly do. But, you know, he wakes up in the morning and you know the part where he's going to fucking open his window and say, uh, boy, boy, what what day is it? It's, it's July 4th. It's not. They don't do that because they're stupid. stupid. They don't even fucking they realize forgot. that they're supposed to do that at this point in the fucking movie. Fucking idiots. <laughs> they were counting on fucking... Alzheimer's Leslie Nielsen to keep track of the plot for them. <laughs> but yeah, but his assistant shows up and tells him it's time for him to head to Madison Square Garden, which is where both his demonstration and the Trace Adkins concert are happening on the same day at the same time. Mm -hmm. I really want to see that hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's it's all very uh, realistic. Yeah, the uh, the protesters are all chanting, "We love Michael Moore." Mm -hmm. That's yep. that's what we chanted that at Occupy. I did. Yeah. That. Yeah, oh, yeah. I remember in New York we chanted, "We love Michael Moore." Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what it was all about, letting everybody know. And then just to, I guess to make their JFK look alike look more look alike, they trot out their Jimmy Carter look alike, who is in appearance and voice closer to Bill Clinton, right? I don't, I have a hunch <laughs> that the people who made this movie don't know who Jimmy Carter is. <laughs> <laughs> He's Southern guy. It had something to do with peanuts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'll work. White hair. That's, but you got it. Who hates Jimmy Carter? The, next to fucking Mr. Rogers, it is hard to find a person more worth admiration than Jimmy fucking Carter. Oh, he pointed out that uh, uh, that uh, Israel was an apartheid state, though. So he's that's bad. He's oh, bad. that's bad. OK, I get yeah. it. But yeah, so they have him. They trot him out for a little while. Michael Moore, he's learned his lesson now, and he doesn't want to give the big anti-war speech that he was planning on giving. Right. Because the ghosts taught him the true meaning of the Fourth of July. So he goes, to, he runs and he hides in a porta potty. And all the characters that were supposed to have been dream characters show up to slap him more. Yeah. Okay. So Kevin Farley and now Kelsey Grammer shows up and Bill O'Reilly shows up. Those three real human beings were in a portable toilet at the same time. <laughs> and a French lady didn't do it. Like nothing yep. went horribly wrong. Oh, wow. I'm an atheist. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody in New York City knew this was this. This was filmed in New York, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm some of it was certainly. Yeah. yeah. Forget what Mark Wahlberg could have done on that plane. Mark Wahlberg could have tipped over this port of potty. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> so, yeah. So, but he's decided that he's got to go and, and tell the truth to those damn liberals, even if they don't want to hear it. Again, at one point, Kelsey Grammer's character says, you know, our nation is facing the greatest evil since Nazism. Now, they're talking about Islamic terrorism, but that is such a vast and baseless overstatement that it took me a while to figure out what they even meant. Right. Yeah. Hey, movie. Uh, quick thing. The greatest evil since Nazism is Nazism. Still Nazism. It's, 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 still it's Nazism. more Nazism. You haven't quite kicked that habit yet there, Republicanism. Yeah. Jesus. First remove the plank from thine eye. So, yeah, but but we see Jimmy Carter surrendering to the terrorists on the screen because that's what he would do. He would surrender totally French person. big old sad, stupid, charitable Jimmy Jimmy Carter with his building houses for children and 
securing democracies in developing countries. The asshole, like an asshole. Idiot. Idiot. <laughs> so <laughs> honestly, if the rest of this movie and the review was just us doing that, it would be better <laughs> than the way it actually ends. Yeah. All right. So but so Michael Moore takes the stage and he says I know that you people think that universal health care and global warming and gun rights are important. And I'm like, end of speech. Are you are you really <laughs> going to throw a butt on that? Sure is. Yep. But as a nation, we are insufficiently afraid of Muslims is the point. Mm -hmm. So they all throw lettuce at him. And he gets he gets saved by the soldiers that are there for the Trace Atkins concert. And he's like, oh, thank you. And this is my favorite ham handed line. They go, don't thank us. Thank the recruiter that came to our college campus. Jesus. Yes. Uh huh. Un fucking believable. And let's not lose track of the fact that the, the denouement of their fucking movie is him claiming that Muslim terrorism is a greater threat to the people in America. Then global fucking warming. Yep. Just let's underscore that one one final time. All right. So, but as though we haven't suffered enough, this movie still has a Trace Adkins concert to drag us through. Which, in this movie's defense, they will admit sucks. That's true. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The whole throughout this movie, Michael Moore has been like, country music sucks. This movie will never go. No, country music is good. They'll be like, yeah, I mean, country Man, music kind of suck. Absolutely. Listen to Trace Adkins. He fucking God, what a waste of space. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, they're saying put your name at the top of his list. All right. OK. <laughs> yeah. So and and just here's how bad it is for us. He goes into this concert. It's not even Trace Adkins yet. We're getting his opening act. We have to sit through a number from fucking what the whiskey vomit. What were these guys? Oh, God, I wasn't paying yep. attention. Yeah, I, I believe it was whiskey vomit. OK, I, think <laughs> yeah. I mean, musically, it was definitely whiskey vomit. But yeah, yep. the, my experience of it watching it yesterday was what you said. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looked like when I was done, too. Yeah. So, yeah, but the but the soldiers see Michael Moore there and they don't want him at their troop supporting concert. So he has to run away. <laughs> well, he doesn't have to run away, though. It's the best. So they're all yelling at him. They're like, oh, you're the commie documentary guy. Fuck you. We like troops. And then <laughs> Whiskey Vomit, the band, has like a couple flash pots go off. And oh, yeah. All, all the country fans get distracted. They're like, ooh, sparkly lights. And he runs away without <laughs> they forget to keep yelling at him. Right. So he doesn't even have to really like escape. A bright light distracted them like my cats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're like, we do want to go out. We want to go out. We want to go out. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Who jingled keys? Yeah, but so he runs away. He's hiding backstage. And this is where he runs into... Ahmed Mohammed, who explained that they're actually they've been working with a terrorist the whole time who's there trying to blow up the concert. They're having second thoughts. They've decided they love America and freedom and stuff. But Aziz is still planning on detonating the bomb in the middle of the concert. Yeah. So in an effort to stop it, he has to run on stage, take over the concert and give a speech about how he's learned something here today. Yeah. If ever there was an audience primed for a quick look amongst you for the brownest person, that guy's a terrorist. A Trace Atkins concert <laughs> is the ideal audience. <laughs> oh, every single person in that audience was doing ocular pat downs since they got inside Madison Square Garden <laughs> and they're ready. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But the movie, of course, can't admit that. So instead, he has to like shave in a haircut Aziz mm -hmm. by saying, who wants to kill all the Americans? And he stands up and he goes, me. Oh, shit. Me. Oh, oh dang. Fuck it. So he runs off. Ahmed and, and Muhammad chase him into a bathroom so we can have a they're trying to disarm the bomb. But it sounds like they're having gay sex series of jokes. OK, Two of the writers of this movie got into an argument over which branch of the military is the gayest. <laughs> so they do the joke twice. <laughs> they do as the two Marines come in and they're like sailors. And then the other writer was like, and then and then they keep trying to do it. And then two super cool sailors come in and they say Marines. Yep. Got them. Is how the Dave. joke goes. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Again, they have to, even when their joke is bad homophobia, they have to shit on it. It's right. amazing. They don't quite nail the bad homophobia in their film. Oh, wow. And they realize it and try again and still fail. Yeah. 
So, but they do disarm the bomb with only a couple seconds left, and they come in and they tell Michael Moore that everything's going to be okay. And then Trace Adkins says to the Michael Moore character, again, welcome to the real America, and then waves at a, a crowd of hundreds and hundreds of exclusively white people. Mm-hmm. They don't even realize they're doing that. That's how I like they're so fucking racist that they didn't even occur to them that they're like, we need to at least put two black guys up towards the front or something. Right. Yep. Anyway, so Trey starts singing. He's going to sing us out. The opening line of his song is literally. This is the greatest country in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> it's the my dad could beat up your dad's song. Ah. <laughs> uh. Isn't there a line about, like, we have the coolest beer and the prettiest girls? Yep, that's the next line. Okay. And our military could kick your military's ass. Okay, he literally names the four branches. I don't know how many branches. He names all the branches of the military we have. He does not name the Space Force. And our pants look normal and not like we have boners. (laughs) If you name the branches of the military in your song, you have COVID right now. You have Uh, COVID. I didn't shit myself in that Taco Bell parking lot. <laughs> what happened is someone else shat, and then I sat in it while I was helping a nun who had fallen down. You don't know her. She's from Canada. <laughs> You're crying. I'm Trace Adkins. <laughs> And Michael Moore looks out into the crowd and he sees like a line of older and older timey American soldiers that died for his freedom to have this family restaurant here or whatever. And then he realizes that his nephew Josh is shipping out to Afghanistan that night and he still hasn't even seen him off. So he rushes down to the docks to see him off. Right. And of course, the movie talks about how. We will definitely win the war in Afghanistan. There's sure no doubt that that will end up being a positive outcome that the U.S. military can be proud of forever. Yep. It's going to go great. And then we make some more disabled kids jokes. Yep. They all fall off a thing. Yep. It's it. They end the fucking scene like a citation needed skit. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, they should should have killed a lot of characters a lot sooner. That would have been nice. Yeah. But yeah, and then the movie's like, oh, well, how do we um, end it? And they're like, well, we could have Kelsey Grammer show back up. And they're like, isn't that a figment of his imagination in this movie? They're like, eh, 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 whatever. So yeah, he wanders off with Kelsey Grammer. Then Leslie Nielsen cuts in for a little voiceover wrap up about how then Michael Moore made movies about how much America was awesome and he loved it and people liked those movies a lot and people loved those movies and we did not lose 13 million (laughs) dollars damn straight we we didn't yeah the, the closing message of the movie that gets every single thing wrong is I bet people will really like this movie (laughs) (laughs) You should make a documentary about how America is great. I want him to be like, oh, okay, well, I know a guy named Dinesh who could actually help. <laughs> terrorist. You're a terrorist. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Well, that's it. I, I We could put a question here, but then we would have to think about this movie for longer and there's Why? other options. <laughs> so that's going to do it for a review of that, which shall not be named. Uh, we're not done with the episode just yet because we still need to reel you in next week. So Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah. As bad as this week's movie is, next week's movie is amazing. We'll be talking about the sequel we didn't know was a sequel until we started recording and Noah told us. <laughs> Ken Del Vecchio Christmas movie, A Karate Christmas Miracle. Oh, it's... Yeah, no, this was a get ahead episode. We had a ton of fucking fun with this one. (laughs) So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 331 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon owners that helped make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Alias, Citation Data, D&D Minus, and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Beautiful Giraffes on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnagam, no illusions. Promise to work hard or earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. 
According to Amazon, if you like this movie, you'll also enjoy a pocket guide to skull shape. <laughs> this movie would go on to make about seven million dollars on a budget of twenty million, or about one seventeenth what Fahrenheit nine eleven made. <laughs> This movie would go on to inspire 266 9-11s worth of COVID deaths wow. and counting. Wow. Woof. And none of them were Kevin Sorbo. Yet. 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 Checking. <laughs> <laughs> Refresh. No. No. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.